Hello, and welcome to our fifth lecture in Module 6 in this summer series or online series on cognition. Uh, we just finished talking about applied cognition, sorry, memory in the courtroom, and talked a little bit about legal standards for memory. And one of the important questions uh, we get at in both eyewitness testimony and education um, are how do we evaluate our own memory? So with a witness, we're interested in how confident are they in their memory. Um, in education, we're interested in how do I know that I've studied something enough or long enough or well enough to know that I will remember it later. So one is a question of retrospective memory, retrospective confidence. So how confident are you that you've identified the correct suspect um, versus trying to project your memory into the future? How, will I, how well do I remember this and how uh, likely is it that I'll remember this for the exam uh, next week? So this is an important uh, question and it's perfectly sort of um, sandwiched in between uh, these two topics because we get into uh, questions of education next. So metamemory is uh, part of a field called metacognition and basically it's uh, knowledge and awareness of our own memory or knowing what we know or what we don't know. Uh, this is a former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense under the uh, George Walker Bush administration. And he has this great quote that's about metamemory, but not about metamemory. There are known knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we know we don't know we don't know. <laughs> Aside from the slightly word saladish portion of that, uh, it is essentially correct in that there are things that we know that we know and the things that we know that we don't know, but do we know, know that we unknown? Uh, <laughs> much more um, pithy and uh, on point is the wise man is one who knows what he does not know. And from both a retrospective and prospective uh, perspective, uh, this is really important, knowing what we don't know. So that gets at what we're going to talk about today. What are metacognition and metamemory? How do we predict later memory performance, what we call judgments of learning? We'll talk about why metamemory is part of uh, the problem with uh, why students continue to cram for tests. And then we'll finish out talking about improving metamemory through testing. So what are metacognition and metamemory? Uh, basically, metamemory is knowledge and awareness of one's own, or sorry, metacognition is knowledge and awareness of one's own cognitive process or one's own memory, which is metamemory. Uh, this is critical to understanding things like learning. How do we know what we've actually learned versus what we think we've learned? And so this is a really important question um, because when we're talking about uh, self-paced or self-directed learning, which is what most students do, they have to go home and study and then think about whether or not they've studied enough, have they studied, you know, what do they need to study more, what do they need to study less, um, what do they already know. So th this is important because you need to prioritize uh, what to study um, away from class. So we study metacognition by asking participants to make predictive judgments about their learning using what's called a judgment of learning, which is basically um, rate on a scale of 1 to 10 or 0 to 90 or 0 to 100, how likely is it that you'll remember this on a later memory test? Um, there are also what are called ease of learning judgments, um, which is how easy do you think this was to learn? Um, but fairly similar, um, if a little bit different. Uh, other times we're interested in how well someone believes that they have performed. So um, we can do retrospective confidence ratings. So this might be on an exam. How well do you think you did? Uh, some people do this question by question. What's your confidence that this was correct, this question? Um, and also, retrospective confidence ratings are becoming an important part of understanding witnesses. Um, how confident are you that this is the um, suspect in the lineup? Uh, so, judgments of learning are uh, how we predict later memory performance. And in general, we are all terrible at this. Um, we pretty much just stink. Uh, we often fall prey to what are called metacognitive illusions. Um, fairly... Um, Important study by uh, Matt Rhodes and Alan Castle um, call on perceptual fluency effect, which they uh, basically showcase this idea of metacognitive illusions and how we can fall prey to them. And the idea of perceptual fluency is that the easier something is to perceive, the easier it seems uh, to learn. That is, we think it's easier to learn, when in fact, 
it, it's either not easier to learn, it's just the same as anything else, or oftentimes it's the exact opposite. In fact, the easier thing to learn um, is often what we will remember not as well. So this is a basic, um, very simple uh, way to think about this. So in uh, the Roads and Castle studies, they did things like this. Uh, very easy to read, a large font versus a s s smaller font. Um, so here, participants might rate bird as being easier to remember than dog, when in fact, there's not much effect on memory. There might be a, a smidge in some of our research. We found uh, some, some memorial benefit for larger font items, but not enough, not anywhere near as much as participants thought. So they thought this was really helping their memory compared to this small font. Uh, or they were much more likely to remember this large font word. And when it was just, it was a little bit more likely, but not much. And other studies have found no effect at all. Or we'll have something like this very difficult to read font down here. So this canary is very easy to read. Um, so that's, again, we're talking about perceptual fluency. Um, we can actually easily read this. Whereas this word horse right here is very difficult to read. Uh, and participants will rate this word canary as being easier to remember when, uh, than the word horse. They'll say that's, uh, they're less likely to remember it. But in fact, the opposite is true. Um, these difficult to read kinds of fonts, oftentimes because it requires effort, really you have to kind of get in there and figure out what does that say, um, creates what we call a desirable difficulty. And in fact, you might remember the word horse better than the word canary, when in fact you rated the word canary as easier to remember than the word horse. We'll talk about desirable difficulties in our next lecture. So uh, similar to uh, the perceptual fluency effects, Shanna Carpenter, uh, and this paper's been out actually for a while, I need to update that, um, has this really clever study on instructional fluency, instructor fluency, um, where she has uh, students uh, do lectures on kittens and some other stuff, and essentially they have one that's organized, uh, very fluent, and another one that's disorganized where the instructor's not very fluent, and um, students rate the fluent instructor as being, uh, they're more likely to remember their lecture versus the disfluent instructor. And in fact, they're actually more likely to remember some stuff from the disfluent instructor because they had to think about it and make sense of it. Um, now, we would never argue that people shouldn't be disfluent uh, in their teaching. That is, we should, you know, the fluent instructor is certainly, we would call that the preferable version. The problem is, is that students may um, lapse into believing that they'll remember things later. Because the instructor was fluent, they were organized, they were entertaining, and so they get you know into thinking, oh, I'll remember this later, it's so interesting, uh, when in fact that isn't the case. And in fact, in my history, I had a really terrific professor named Wayne Viney, who um, taught our history and systems of psychology class, and he had these really terrific stories he would tell. And so you would just get so wrapped up in what he was saying that you'd leave the class with not a single note written down. You'd have no idea what you talked about, but this great story, um, because it just got to be so interesting. And so you have to, it's something to be mindful of, uh, that the instructors that are good and organized and provide a, an interesting lecture, you may fall prey to thinking that you're gonna remember things better than when you actually might not. Again, the problem is we feel like we have learned because the material seems easier. And this is a really important uh, thing to think about when you're talking about exam performance, student studying, uh, trying to improve learning, is we have to um, watch out for these metacognitive illusions and we have to try to um, break through them and try to realize they're there and that something that seems easy probably is too easy and probably isn't doing as much good. So you have to, studying has to have some effort. Uh, we'll talk about that in our next lecture. So and that gets us at the question of meta memory and mass studying or cramming. So if you study all in one session versus spacing it out over time, you're actually going to perform worse than if you space out your studying over time. And we're going to talk more about this in our next lecture. Um, so the spacing effects and what are called interleaved practice are very clear effects that if you study, say, 15 minutes a day over four days, uh, your performance will be much better than if you study all at once for an hour. The problem is mass study leads to a metacognitive illusion. So let's say um, you've got an essay you're supposed to read um, or you know, a couple of papers you're supposed to read, a couple of chapters uh, that you're going to have a quiz on. So you sit down and read the chapter and then you read it again. Um, and maybe you take some notes and then you kind of keep doing that. 
the problem is, is each time you go through it, it seems easier because you had just read it. And so because it's so recent, it feels easy. When in fact, that sense of ease has nothing to do with whether or not you'll remember it later. It's what we call an illusion of confidence. Uh, that is, the more you keep reading something or the more you keep looking over your notes um, in this kind of uh, mass practice or cramming session, result in this illusion of confidence. So as that continues, learners use what's called an ease of acquisition heuristic to guide learning. It's like, okay, well, that was easy. Um, that was easy. And so obviously I've acquired that. So we'll just go on to something else. When in fact, that stuff that seems easy is something they haven't learned at all. It's simply because it's so recent. Uh, this results in little long-term retention and uh, really is a problem. Now, it's an hour before the exam. This is probably your best shot. Um, short term, it's probably going to do it. Uh, but over time, this is not the way to study. In fact, you can study less if you uh, study smarter, and that will be in our next lecture. Because this is such a powerful illusion, this mass study illusion of competence, it's really difficult to get people to break this habit and use better strategies. Um, I fight with students all the time about this. Um, because better practice requires being more organized, dedicating the time every day. Um, and essentially, learning is just like anything else. You know, you can't run in a marathon without practicing every day, without building up to that marathon. Um, you surely don't want to walk into an exam um, with having just glanced over your notes uh, for an hour. So if you're going to run a, a marathon, uh, going running, uh, trying to run, let's see, what a marathon's about 26 miles, so trying to run 70 miles a day before is not the way to do it, right? You're never going to make it. Learning's the same way. So how do we improve meta memory? Well, the best thing is to test yourself. In the cognitive literature, uh, we find uh, pretty significant improvements in meta memory by delayed judgments of learning. And delayed judgment of learning is fairly simple. In uh, immediate judgments of learning, here's a word, how likely are you to remember it later? Or let's say it's uh, word pairs, a hot and bus. And so, an immediate judge of learning, um, you know, in 30 minutes when you get a memory test, how likely are you to remember bus when presented with the word hot? Um, so it's right in front of you. In a delayed judgment of learning, what we do is we say, all right, earlier you studied uh, a pair of words. How likely are you to remember the word that was associated with hot? Well, now the participant has to try to remember. And so what they do is they try to recall, and if they can't recall it, they get a retrieval failure. And then if they don't remember it then, they're not going to remember it later. So you have to evaluate your learning by trying to remember. And what you can remember, that's, that stuff's good. What you can't remember, uh, you need to study again. Now, critically, you can't do this right after studying. That is, if you want to study something, you need to set it aside, study something else, and then try to remember um, what was in your notes. So using self-testing um, to evaluate your memory is really critical. So what you can do is, uh, if you're as insane as I was as a student, you can just try to recreate your notes from memory. And that's what I used to do. I would create an outline of my course notes, and then I would work on memorizing it, and then I would set it aside, and I would reproduce the entire thing from memory. And then I would go back and see what I forgot. Uh, and it's a really effective strategy, because then you only have to focus on learning the stuff you didn't know. And so, if you're in a math class, sit down and do, go through the problems. Um, and, you know, don't look at the book, just go through the problems, see what you can do, and then whatever ones you couldn't do, those are the ones you need to work on. Uh, and so, this allows you to be more targeted and more efficient. And so, you can actually perform better by studying less. So, that's what we're going to get at to next. In our next lecture, we're going to talk about learning how to learn. And that uh, is something we'll talk uh, for a little bit of time about.